Esther says, good. And I do believe I am live on Facebook. Oh, wait. Do I have my water? Got to get my water. Hold on. Have my hands full, bringing everything. So forgot to grab my water, but I got my water because I'm gonna need my water because I don't need my voice. My voice gonna stay strong because it's gonna stay hydrated. <laughs> Today's prophetic word is intense. I know you think I say that every week, but the Lord has been given some intense words. So I'm um, just like, bless his high and holy name. I'm just proud to be a part of his kingdom and proud to do my job. So we're going to give people a few minutes to come on. I'll let my Facebook group know. Uh, going to be some unusual stuff today, but that's all right. That is all right. Uh, that is all right, because sometimes stuff happens that's unusual. There's my sister. Hey, sis, it's my sister on Facebook. Um, waiting for some more people to come on on Instagram. Oh. But um, yeah, so, you know, that's part of the prophetic, part of the way that God teaches you and part of the way that God trains you, you have to say what the Holy Ghost tells you to say no more, no less. And you have to learn how to, how to stay with that because that's always what makes the difference. It's when you're, you have to be a vessel. You have to let the spirit of God speak through you. It's not your words. It's not your message. It's not about you. It's about who the spirit of God wants to reach. And also, if you don't know this about the prophetic, it's about the words that have to be released in the earth. And what, what I mean by that is a lot of people don't understand why Jesus showed up when he did. Because remember, God promised Jesus in the garden right after Adam and Eve had sinned. But Jesus did not show up on earth until many years later. Do you know why? Because all the words that needed to be spoke about who he was and what he was going to do needed to be re released in the earth realm before the Lord showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll see if I can do a teach on that sometime. That's how deep it is. So that's why prophetically, it's so important that you say what the Lord is telling you to say. Very important. All right, 2.30, we're going to get started. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for seeing another Sunday. These seven days have flown by at lightning speed. But thank you for them seven days you just gave us. And here we are at the beginning of another week, another Sunday, another chance to serve you. So we just praise you and thank you for your matchless grace. That righteousness comes apart from works is the gift of God, not of works, lest we should boast that you gave it to us freely because of the Lord's sacrifice. And thank you, Jesus, for making that sacrifice. So, Father, I surrender myself to you right now. I must decrease so you can increase. And I ask you to breathe through me, speak through me, Lord. Let every word be spoken be what you want spoken to glorify your name to the glorification of God, that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified that the demons might be terrified and that sinners would be mortified, that they would not want to live one more day without you outside of your umbrella of protection. I thank you for it. And I believe you for it in Jesus name. And I'm expecting you, I'm expecting you to do great things and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow those that believe, receive and walk in this word. In Jesus name, I do declare, decree it and pray it. Amen. All right. Amen. And amen. Today's live prophetic word is measure. Today's live prophetic word is measure. Let me put that on screen. Today's live prophetic word is measure. Okay. Now I'm going to read from our scripture passage uh, and I'm going to read uh, this whole chapter. So it's going to be a lot of reading. So you just have to hang in there with me. Okay, I know sometimes we got the attention span of a fruit fly. Sometimes we, woo, and then we out. <laughs> and if things don't happen in seconds, 
we just clock on out. We just don't want to hear it. He ain't moving fast enough. But uh, today, you'll see what I mean. Today, it's actually really necessary that I read all of this. So I'm going to read this, and then we're going to go into what the Holy Ghost wants to be released, what the Holy Ghost wants uh, said. All right. We're going to read from Daniel chapter five. This is a very, very familiar passage of scripture. I'm sure you've heard of it. Or you've heard uh, parts of it. Daniel chapter five. I actually have to read the whole thing. So I'm going to Daniel chapter five and I'm reading out of the NIV, the New International Version. I always tell you that to let you know there are different translations of the Bible and different uh, things we're reading and interpreting from. So I'm going to have to read all these verses, but out of the NIV, you'll see, you'll see why as soon as we go into the exegesis or explanation or the prophetic flow, you'll see why all of this written word has to be spoken. Here it comes. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold, tab gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Okay, so what's the setup here? We have a king, his name is Belshazzar. His father was Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had raided and robbed the temple of God in Jerusalem. Belshazzar, the king in our story, is there with his nobles, so he has his court, he has his wives and his concubines, so obviously he's living polygamy. So he's got his multiple wives and multiple concubines, and they're gonna drink from these sacred uh, these sacred goblets, these sac sacred cups and saucers, these sacred parts that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen, Nebuchadnezzar being his father, had stolen from God's temple in Jerusalem. So they brought in those gold goblets and they drank from them. All them people drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they started praising their gods. And what they believed in uh, was gods of gold and silver of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. That can mean actual idols that they built made out of those substances. It can also mean like we do that you can worship money. Like you can be, you can think, or you can be big ball and shot calling. You know how we make it rain sometimes <laughs> and we're giving glory to the money, how much money we got. It can mean that too. Verse five, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. The, the king summoned the enchanters, astrologers and diviners. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Okay, so Belshazzar, King of Babylon said suddenly, the fingers of a human hand. So uh, not the hand, but the fingers of the hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. And the king watched it and all the color drained out of his face. And he got so frightened that he got, you know, weak and his knees started knocking, you know, like an old Scooby-Doo cartoon, uh, zoinks, like that, that's what happened. Then he summoned all the worldly soothsayers, the psychics, the astrologers, the enchanters, the spellcasters, those that study the stars, those that cast spells, and those that use objects to divine stuff. Okay. So, you know, a lot of psychics, like a lot of uh, necromancers, that type of thing. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads the writing, so he told them that he was going to give them. Uh, being clothed in purple, purple is the color of royalty, and he was going to give him a gold chain, and he was going to make him the third highest ruler. So he was going to go all the way up underneath the king and the queen. 
Verse eight, then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Remember what I told you a couple, a couple of weeks ago about all the people that make fun of Jesus and they say that Jesus isn't real and that the Bible is ancient and it's not relevant. And why would anybody listen to it? Remember I told you what to ask people when they say that? What they got to offer. Can they get you up out of a wheelchair? Can they help you have a baby when you are too old and past the age or when your reproductive organs don't work? Can they save you from the violence of fire? Can they save you from the mouth of a lion? Can, what do they have? All of the people that make fun of Jesus Christ, I'm going to ask it again. What are they offering you? What is their alternative? Okay, because it's been proven over and over again that the Lord is a God of fertility, that the Lord can save you from the violence of fire because I'm a fire survivor. I told you my testimony. Okay, you couldn't tell that by looking at me that I ran through a burning building without a scratch, my son too. That what do they have to offer you? The Lord is the one. So the king called in all these people that were the, you know, the people that were supposed to be able to speak into the spirit world and divine and figure out what was going on. And they couldn't figure out. So the king got more scared and the nobles were baffled. They're like, mm, we ain't got nothing. So remember, every time you hear somebody make fun of the Lord, Every time you hear somebody put down Christians, what are they offering you? What are they offering you? Okay. Verse 10, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. I find that interesting that the queen went in the hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. Mm. So the queen came in and remembered this Hebrew man. I'm going to come back to that because there's more in there I need to talk about. Let's keep reading. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah, one of the exiles of the Jews, the Hebrews? I've heard that the spirit of the gods is in you and that you have inside intelligence and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Don't tell me the prophetic doesn't have value. <laughs> the prophetic has spiritual value, the prophetic has social value, the pro prophetic has status value, and the prophetic has financial value. You just read it. Well, the king said he'd give Daniel if Daniel was able to interpret what was going on. Okay. Verse 17, then, Dan, then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards for, to someone else. I love Daniel. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. So even though all that stuff has value. Daniel said, I ain't taking your gifts. <laughs> Daniel said, you ain't buying me. <laughs> See, both things are true. It has value and it makes a difference and it will stand you before kings. But Daniel said that uh, you can't buy me with it though. I'm gonna tell you what it means, but you know, you keep all your gifts and give your rewards to someone else. Cause Daniel said he ain't taking nothing from no unbelieving king. Your majesty, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor, verse 18. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal 
he lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. So basically God made Nebuchadnezzar live like an animal for a month out there brand uh, with the donkeys and eating grass like the ox. He busted that man down to think he was an animal from being a king to being an animal out there grazing in the fields with the oxen. Verse 22, but you Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have the goblets from his temple brought to you and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines drink wine from them. You praise the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Meany, meany, Tico Parson. Here is what those words mean. Meany, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tico, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez or Parson, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Verse 29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Good Lord. So to re-sum up that story, the king of Babylon, King Belshazzar, was having a party. He decided to bring in the goblets, the sacred goblets from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And then the Lord had a sign appear where the fingers of a hand wrote himself on a wall. He called in all of his soothsayers. They couldn't interpret what that meant. The queen ran in and said, calm down, calm down, everybody chill. There's a man in the kingdom who the spirit of God is in. Remember that same thing they said about Joseph and he's able to interpret. He's able to understand stuff like this. So call for him and he'll bring you the stuff. He called for him. The king said, are you Daniel? And he offered him all that stuff. That's what I meant when I said it has value. People argue for it. But Daniel wisely said, yeah, no, I'm not taking your stuff because your stuff is cursed anyway. And I'm not put, bringing that over here. But I will give you the prophetic interpretation. Then he gave him a history lesson about how powerful Nebuchadnezzar was and how God basically gave Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness, glory and splendor. In other words, he set him up to be a mighty king and he could do what he wanted. But then his heart got lifted up and Nebuchadnezzar refused to give glory to God for all that he had done for him. So then God struck that man. God struck that king and turned him into an animal. He gave him the mind of an animal. I'm going to say that one more time. That's in verse 21. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven. He out there on the ground like your dog would be or like a rabbit or like a possum or like a squirrel. The king, that mighty king was out there like that because his heart got lifted up and he refused to glorify God for all that God had done for him. And he stayed that way until he repented and he acknowledged God, okay? Belshazzar is the son of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel said, you have not humbled yourself though you knew all that. You saw what your father went to. You saw the glory God gave your father. You saw the pride of your father. You saw how God busted him down to think he was an animal. And Daniel told King Belshazzar, you knew all that and you still didn't humble yourself. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven, you had the goblets from his temple brought to you and all your party drank from them. And you praised all them other gods which cannot see or under, hear, hear or understand, but you didn't honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore he sent the hand, now there's a description that it was a hand, because when we first hear it, it says he saw the four fingers of the hand, and then Daniel said it was a full hand. And the inscription, mini mini tickle parson, God has numbered the days of your reign, brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then the king still gave Daniel what he said he would, even though Daniel said, I don't want all that. Daniel still at least got clothed in purple and got the gold chain and was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So Daniel said, I'm not doing what I'm doing for money. 
I'm not doing what I'm doing for your gifts, but I'm going to give you the interpretation of the prophetic word thereof. And then Daniel still got the purple robe, the gold chain, and he got to be the third highest ruler in the kingdom. I don't have time to tell you the background, but basically how when they were in exile, uh, Israel lost and they got sold into slavery. They got sold into exile and then they started going back to Jerusalem. But some of the people were born in exile. And so they were basically born slaves. They were born in captivity. And so this is just like the story of Joseph. Joseph was in Egypt, but he got lifted up to sit in the second chair right underneath Pharaoh, even in the king of Egypt, where Pharaoh was the king. A Hebrew slave became the second in command. Well, here in the kingdom of Babylon, where Israel had been captive, okay, a Hebrew man got lifted up to be the third ruler in the kingdom because of the prophetic, because he honored God, because he had a humble heart. And then that very night, the same night of the party, when he had given Daniel all this stuff and Daniel gave him the interpretation, uh, Darius the Mede came in and killed King Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, and took over his kingdom. And Darius was 62 years old, taking over this kingdom. That's one of the most intense stories in the scripture. So this is where the phrase, we saw the handwriting on the wall comes from. Have you ever heard that phrase in your life? Where somebody said, well, the handwriting's on the wall. That's this story. That's Daniel 5. That's where that comes from, if you didn't know that. Okay? So that's definitely deep, and that's definitely intense, but I'm sure you want to know. What's that got to do with us? What's that got to do with now? Good question, and it deserves a good answer. Here it comes. The Spirit of God wanted me to say that we're in a time... And we're in a season where this is what God is doing. What God is doing is he's observing how people are living and who they're giving glory to. Now, let me throw this in on the side. If you come, if you come from a godly family, you can't keep living in a kind of way you want to. You can't just keep living like the world. You can't keep living in sin. You can't keep ignoring your godly heritage. If you got a praying mother, if you got a praying grandmother, if you got a praying father, if you got a praying grandfather, you can't just live like people that don't know the Lord. You can't live like an unbeliever. You can't live like you didn't come. Like if you grew up in church and you're around the people of God, and you're around the word of God, and you're around anointing, and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, or you've seen people filled with the Holy Ghost. Any kind of exposure like that in childhood to God's kingdom, you cannot then go out and act like you don't know that, like you don't know that God is real and you don't know who the Lord is. Here in this story, Daniel chastises Belshazzar for not learning his lesson from the example of his dad, that his dad was so powerful, he could literally do whatever he wanted. Daniel said, if, if King Nebuchadnezzar wanted you dead, you die. And if the king wanted you spared, you were spared. He had that kind of power. People just lived and died at his command. But he got full of himself. Daniel chastised Belshazzar saying, you didn't learn the lesson from your father. So here you are pitting yourself against the Lord of heaven. What does that mean? That means he went and got the goblets, the sacred goblets that were set aside for the temple of God. And he said, we're going to drink out of that, spitting in God's face. Ha, 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 I'm going to go get your goblets. That's like somebody breaking in a cathedral or somebody breaking in a church and taking in, taking, you know, any of the elements from the church, any of the candlesticks, any of the goblets, any of the trays, any of the Bibles, anything that's set aside for the house of God and taking those sacred things and making them common things, taking things that are part of the sacrament and making them common, spitting in God's face, basically saying that this stuff that's holy and set aside for you use, that don't mean nothing. We're going to use it like it's a common thing. We're going to drink our wine. And 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 he said, we're going to praise our gods drinking our wine out of your cups. Let me tell you something. You can't front God off like that. You can't front God off like that. You can't chest bump up against God. You know, sometimes when you get ready to fight, we chest bump. If you want something and we push you, you know, push somebody out your face, you can't, you can't chest bump up against God like that. 
That's the sign of a, 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 a arrogant heart and a stupid head. You can't you can't intimidate God most high. You can't chest bump him against God like that. But Belshazzar did, and Daniel chastised him. He said, "Your father did the same foolish, foolishness, and you didn't learn nothing." So again, to bring that into what the Holy Ghost is saying to us now, we are in a season where God is doing this thing right here, where God is looking at who's serving Him and who's not, when God is looking at who's giving Him glory and who's not. And where God is looking to see if those that are of great power and great wealth and great influence are giving glory to the God of heaven. Because the scripture says that promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south. But God is the one. He sets down one and puts up another. Hold on. Let me read that scripture to you so you know I'm, I'm not making that up. That's why I like to read stuff to you. Know? That's why I like to give you the address so you can see it for yourself. You know, one of the things that a lot of ministers of God get accused of is just making stuff up, just pulling it, you know, out of a hat, just pulling it out of thin air. This is Psalm 75, six through seven. It says, for promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Psalm 75, six through seven. So that means that when you get blessed in life, when you have advancement in life, when you have exaltation in life, when you have wealth in life, any of that, that only happens because God allowed it. And we are in a time where God is measuring, measuring the kingdoms of man measuring the kingdoms of people. We are in a time where God is measuring what we're doing. And because God doesn't change, what the Holy Ghost is trying to say through this is that if we are as King Nebuchadnezzar, we are great, we have accomplished much, we have great wealth, we have great power, we have great influence. And if you're sitting in some of the highest seats in the land, the people actually live and die at your command. If your heart gets lifted up and you refuse to give glory to the God of heaven, God going to bring you down. God going to bring you all the way down. See, see, some just shoot through me when I say that God going to bring you all the way down. Haven't we seen people that look like they was all the way up and then they came all the way down? I mean, all the way down. I mean, they crashed hard, too. Well, the Holy Ghost is warning us through this prophetic word and through the written word. Remember I told you? Three levels of word, written word, living word, and prophetic word. That this is, we're in a season where God is doing this, this thing right here, right now, in this story in Daniel chapter five. Uh, meaning says, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. So in other words, God can put an end to your kingdom anytime he gets ready. He can number your days. And what that means is that he can cut your life short. God can extend your life. He can add life to your years and years to your life or he can cut your day short. He can also cut your, your kingdom short, meaning that you're only gonna be on top for so long. So God can speak from heaven and say, you're only gonna be a top selling artist. You're gonna be a top actor. You're only gonna be a top athlete for five years. And then you are over. If God says that, you're going to have a five-year career. If that's what the Lord said. Then Tico says, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Now, being weighed on the scales, you've seen pictures of justice, that justice is blind and justice has scales. But back in those days, they would weigh things on different scales to purchase stuff to see how much something was worth. They would use weights of gold, weights of silver, and see to see how much something was worth to decide how much to sell it for or purchase it for. So they're very familiar with the concept of scales. And so God is saying here that he was weighed on the scales and found wanting. In other words, God, remember how he's told you in Revelation 2 and 3, that that's the Lord giving grades. That's the Lord talking about the things he sees that he's pleased with and the things that he doesn't. Here he's talking about how he weighs us on his scales. And if you come up in the scale of God and you are found wanting, that means, what that means in, in plain terms, that there's some things in your life that are lacking. 
some 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 things you should be doing or some things that you shouldn't know or some things that you should have had covered or some things that you should have done. And God knows that you know you should have done them. That's why Daniel said that King Belshazzar knew, knew he should have feared the great God of heaven because of what happened to his father. But he didn't. And at least that alone, that and the fact that he was a straight up idolater, he was giving glory to everything but God. Gold and silver, iron, wood and stone. He's giving glory to all that, but not the God of heaven. That means that God can weigh your life and find you wanting. What does that mean to Christians? It can mean that you should have more faith than you do by now. Don't blow that off. Don't minimize what I'm saying. It means that God can look at your life and determine that you should have more faith by now than you do. Is that a real thing in the Bible, Prophet Taylor? It is. <clears throat> I would have brought it up if I couldn't back it up. That first generation that came out of Egypt under Moses, remember that God brought them out of Egypt and God spoiled the Egyptians and they took all that cash and all that money. And then they got to the Red Sea and God put a pillar of fire up and stopped Pharaoh while the Red Sea parted. In the movie, The Ten Commandments, the Red Sea parted in about two minutes. In the Bible, the Red Sea parted all night. It was much slower. But either way, they were out there until that sea parted and they walked over on dry land. And then Pharaoh, the pillar of fire came down and Pharaoh tried to follow him. And that, that water came back like that and drowned Pharaoh. Then people saw that. And then God gave them honey out of the rock. God gave them water out of the rock. God gave them manna from heaven, food that angels eat because angels eat manna. Yes, that's in the Bible. Man did eat angels food, food that angels eat came falling down out the sky every day. And God also, because they were complaining about the bread and water and they wanted more and blah, blah, blah. God sent them quail from the sea, but God sent them so much quail until it started coming out, out their nose. They got sick of it because God didn't was tired of them complaining because they was complaining all the time. So God sent them meat, enough meat to feed half a million people, 600,000 people, a quarter of a million, 1.2 million people. Can you imagine how much quail had to be on the beach to feed that many people. God sent them that. And then them same people, them same people got to the edge of, of the promised land. They got to Kadesh Barnea. They got to the edge of the promised land and God wanted to take them in. And after all them experiences with God, they sent out the 10 spies and Joshua and Caleb came back with a good report. And the rest of them came back, mealy mouth, talking about we can't do it. They're giants in the land. We grasshoppers, remember that? And God cursed them people to wander in the wilderness until they died. And he only took in the people that were under the age of 21, plus Joshua and Caleb. Because their faith wasn't where it should have been. God weighed them in the scales and found them wanting. God said, after all I've done for you, after taking you out of Egypt, setting you free from slavery and letting you leave rich, taking all that stuff of the Egyptians with you, stopping Pharaoh when he tried to pursue you and bring you back parting a Red Sea, drowning Pharaoh in that same Red Sea, giving you honey, giving you water, giving you manna, food from heaven, giving you quail. After all I did for you, you got to the edge of promised land and God said, you still don't believe me? You still don't believe that I'm with you? You still don't believe I could do it? You still don't believe? God weighed the people in the scales and they were found wanting and they died. They never made it. In the movie, so what I'm talking about is the great exodus. In the movie, The Ten Commandments, what that that's basically the story of Moses from birth to death, but also included that story, obviously, is the story of the Exodus, the Hebrew slaves coming out of Egypt. That first generation didn't make it. They died. The people that went into the promised land were 21 and younger, the next generation, because them people didn't have enough faith, even after all the experiences that God gave them, they didn't have enough faith. So God can weigh your life and find you wanting that you should have more faith by now. So don't be one of the people that's been going to church all your life, been going to church 20 or 30 years, and you still, still don't really believe God. You're still a mocker and a scorner. You still make fun of the word of God. You make fun of the people of God. All you're doing is playing church. That's what church is to you. It's just a game. They gonna come, yea, now is, where God is gonna weigh you in the balance and find you wanting if your faith is not where God thinks it should be. And then pair as your kingdom is divided and given to the needs of the Persians. God can divide your kingdom. 
What does that mean? That means that every good thing that's a part of your life, God can take it from you and give it to somebody else. A lot of people, that's why I talk about marriage so much. A lot of people have had good spouses. A lot of people have had perfectly good spouses. A lot of people have had perfectly good marriages, but they weren't grateful. And they did not give God glory for all that he'd done for them. They got disgruntled. They weren't happy. And they broke up their marriages. And God is going to take that relationship and give it to somebody else. God is going to take everything he blessed your kingdom with and give it to somebody else. Because God can divide your kingdom and give it to your enemies. Let me say that one more time. God can divide your kingdom and give it to your enemies. Haven't we seen that? Haven't we seen uh, sports teams that were at the top of their game and then they got divided and they never reached that greatness again? Haven't we seen rich, famous people, celebrities, politicians, whoever, uh, diplomats, uh, uh, whatever? Haven't we seen people at the top, uh, preachers, clergymen, bishops, deacons, elders, apostles, prophets? Haven't we seen people all the way at the top of whatever field they're in, all the way at the top of their industry, all the way at the top of their game? And then their kingdom get divided and they're brought all the way down like Nebuchadnezzar to where they're out there acting a fool like an animal. How do you know when you've been given the mind of an animal when you lose all sense of boundaries? Because animals don't have boundaries. That's why you have to house break a dog. When you bring a dog inside the house, that puppy will squat down and pee right on the floor and do a number two right on the floor until you house break them because they're animals. Pigs wall around in slop and pigs are just as comfortable in mud and slop. And if you've ever seen what pigs eat, oh, but pigs eat that slop out the trough. Do you know why they do that? Because they're pigs. Okay. So when you are living on that pig and that dog level as a human, that means you have thrown away all boundaries. You don't say no to anything. You'll do anything. You'll do anything. You don't have any respect for God and you don't have any respect for yourself. But what Belshazzar did was he fronted God off to his face by having a party and drinking his wine out of the sacred goblets from the temple in Jerusalem, telling God that those sacred things don't mean anything. Okay, <clears throat> do not mess with Christian people. Do not make fun of the saints. Don't make fun of anybody that loves the Lord. Don't make fun of anybody that's serving the Lord. You don't know what you're messing with. You don't know who you're fooling with. You don't know what you're doing. You can make fun of Jesus if you want to. You can make fun of Christians if you want to. But I stopped by to tell you, to warn you, that ain't the thing to do. Because God going to personally jump in it, just like he did in this story of Belshazzar. When you front God off to his face, because the scripture says, God looks upon his children as we are the apple of his eye. We are the apple of his eye. Okay, that means when you poke a believer, it's like poking God literally right in his eye. That's what you're doing. You can't do that and the most high not answer you at some point. You might do it for a while and, and that might fool you into think you got away with it, but you didn't. So God can bring you all the way down and you don't want to front God off and Belshazzar did all this stuff. Then what happens in the text is, wait, I hear a prophetic word coming in the spirit. Okay. What happens in the text is, well, let me deliver this word. Okay, hold on. For behold my people and understand that I am the Lord your God. I am he that judges the reins and the hearts. I am he that tries the heart of the man for the spirit of a man is a candle of the Lord. And I use it to search the innermost parts of the belly. I'm walking among my people. I'm walking among the earth. I'm walking among the people of the earth to see who it is that loves me, to see who it is that serves me, to see who it is that fears me. And to those of you that fear my name, as Daniel was in his story, I'm going to lift you up, even in the kingdom of your enemies, even in the Babylonian kingdoms, I'm going to put you in positions of authority. I'm going to put you in positions of power. I'm going to make them put the gold chain around your neck. I'm going to make them put the purple royal cloth around your shoulders because you love me and because you fear me. And those of you that do not fear me, you will discover my wrath 
against your pride. You will discover that I will number your days and num number your kingdom and bring you to an end. You will discover that I have weighed you in the balances and found you wanting. You will discover that I will divide your kingdom and give it to your enemies. And you will discover that I will bring you down. And if you want to live like an animal and you don't want to honor me, I'm going to give you exactly what you chose and bring your mind down all the way down until you learn how to fear me, until you learn how to honor me, until you learn that I am God and besides me, there is no other and my glory I do not share, says the spirit of the living God. Whew. Whew. That was intense. Oh, there's Margo. Hey, Margo, how you doing on Insta? That was intense. So the Holy Ghost is saying, uh, same thing we said at the beginning of this message, that the Lord is walking among his people, but he's also walking among the people of the earth. Now, let me tell you something about God. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's not there. Where does the wind come from? Where's the wind start? Where's the wind finish? Because the wind can start and then just blow out. Just like tornadoes, they look at the conditions and a tornado can touch down and just as easy as it touched down, it can spin out. And we study all that stuff and we have the science all that on all that stuff. But can we generate it? Can we duplicate it? Do you fully understand it? Just because God is invisible doesn't mean he's not there. That's what you need to understand, that the Lord just told us both in the written word and the prophetic word that he's watching, he's walking, he's around us right now. And he's paying attention to who's giving him glory and who's not, and who loves him and who doesn't, and who fears him and who does not. He just told us that's what he's doing. If the Lord tells you what he's doing, remember that God is a good God and God is a speaking spirit. Do you know what that means? The fact of, of God being a good God means God is the kind of God He's the kind of professor that will always give you the answer to the final before you take the exam. Because God wants you to succeed. God is a speaking spirit. God is a kind of God where he always talks to you first. When God made Adam, he told him what to do and what not to do. He talked to him first. God always talks to you first. Before Cain rose up and killed his brother, God intervened and God talked to him and said, are you doing well to be angry right now? Now's not the time to be angry. But sin lies at the door and his desires to rule over you. God talked to Cain first. Remember how the Lord warned Judas over and over and over again, don't betray me. Don't let the devil do what he's doing in your heart. Remember how the Lord tried to tell Judas not to become the betrayer of the body and the blood of Christ and Judas did it anyway. Because God always talks to you first. Well, now on this broadcast, everybody is watching me live and everybody is watching the replay. I read it to you in the written word and you heard the prophetic word that God is telling us what he's doing because that's in the Bible. The Lord says that he will do nothing unless he first tells his servants to prophet. That's why you hear me say all the time, you need the prophetic in your life. You need the prophetic in your life. You need the prophetic in your life. So the Lord told us what he's doing because he's a good God, because he's a speaking spirit, and because he tells us what he's doing through his service to prophets, through the prophetic. So just because you can't see him don't mean he's not around. So now's the time to get your heart and get your mouth and get your choices in line with honoring God, fearing God, and loving God, because if you don't, this is the kind of time where God is tearing kingdoms down. Did you hear me? God is tearing kingdoms down. And he told you ahead of time that if you don't fear him, he's going to number your days, the days of your reign and bring it to an end. If you don't fear him, he's going to weigh you in the balance because he wants to see who you're giving the glory to. And here, if you don't understand the weight of that sin, let me explain it to you. God created us in his image as humans. God gave us dominion over this planet as humans. And God intended for us to bring him glory for that. God wants all of his creation to praise him. But we as humans have an added blessing, an added favor in that we are the vessels in whom the very Holy Ghost of God dwells. 
There's nothing else that we know of that can get filled with the spirit except us. Do you realize that? Do you realize there's nothing God made that we see in scripture that ever gets filled with the Holy Ghost except us? That means God has given us the privilege and the honor of being indwelt by his very spirit. So if God's going to give us all that blessing and all that grace and all that favor, just in making us humans in his image, and then we turn around and give the praise and the glory that he is due to something else besides him. Can you see how much of an offense that is? How would you like to invest 15, 16, 20, 25 years in your child and get your child through school and get your child accomplishments and get your child through college and get your child into, into a marriage? And then and then somebody asks your child, how did you get there? How you get on in blessings? And your, your child starts talking about somebody lived down the street where you live. <laughs> your child started talking about, well, you know, I saw somebody on YouTube and somebody with a YouTube channel just, you done put 25 years into that child. And here they come giving the credit for your parenting to someone else. How that make you feel? What if you have that situation with a spouse? What if you're the kind of spouse that knows how to hang in there? And what if your spouse had a dream of going back to school? And you said, all right, baby, I'm going to support you through that. It's, it's going to be rough. It's going to be rough on the finances. It's going to be rough on our time together. We're going to have to find a way to still, still spend time together. It's going to be rough on the family. But because you want to go back to school, I'm gonna, we're going to do this together. I'm going to be there with you. And your spouse, your husband and your wife, they go back to school. OK, they work hard. They, they keep their job and they take their classes at night and they work on the weekends and they work and work and work until they get that degree. They finish that bachelor's, they get that two year, they get that tech degree, they get that master's, they get that PhD. When they're walking on the stage, somebody asks them, how'd you get here? And they say, well, I was inspired. Okay, all right, all right, my God, I'm gonna pray for that. I'm gonna pray for that. Um, tell me your name, uh, his or her name. I'm gonna pray for your youngest child. Just hold on, but tell me their name. Um, and they ask you how you get there, Youngest son, okay, tell me his name. And and they ask you how you get there, and then you start giving the glory to something you saw on YouTube or maybe some famous athlete or maybe something like that. And you ignore the contributions of your spouse who hung in there with you, hung in there with you on them long nights when you stayed up all night, them long nights. Where, where they made a sacrifice to hung in there with you and support you and tell you you could do it. And then times that you wanted to throw everything down and throw up your hands and quit. And you had a wife, you had a husband there. They said, it's okay, it's okay, baby, don't quit. You can make it. Take a break if you need to, take a rest, but you can make it. And after all that support and after all that sacrifice, when somebody asked them, then they give the credit to somebody on YouTube. How does that make you feel? Well, that's similar to the feeling God gets when we give glory to anything but him. He's the one that gives us power to give well. He's the one that lifts us, lifts us up. Like I told you, Joseph, Daniel, that's the purview of God. Psalm 75, 6 through 7, I read it to you. He's the one that opens doors because he's the one that opens and no man shuts. And he's the one that shuts and no man opens. That's all Jesus. So how are you going to get blessed beyond measure? And then somebody asks you how you got there and you refuse to give any glory to the savior. Because remember, God is the creator, he's the redeemer, and he's the judge. He made all this. He turned himself into a man to pay for the sin of all this. And now he judges all this and rightfully so, because Jesus is both God and man. Everything God is, you find in Jesus. And everything we're supposed to be, you find in Jesus. So he's the focal point of all that exists. And you going to get blessed and then give the glory to something besides him. How do you think that makes the Lord feel? That's so what I'm trying to tell you. You wouldn't want your child to act like you didn't have nothing to do with how they turned out and who they are. And you wouldn't want your spouse that you helped get that extra degree act like you weren't even there. If you, if us being evil would take offense and stuff like that, how much more the God of heaven? when we don't give him the glory that's due his name. That's what I'm trying to tell you. So God is telling us that he is walking among us with this in mind.
So now's the time because the professor has given us the answer to the final before we take the exam. Because the Lord has warned us scripturally and prophetically as to what he's doing right now. Because the Bible says that surely the Lord God does nothing except he first tells his servants to prophets. That's why you need the prophetic in your life. Don't listen to people talking about, ain't no more apostles and prophets now. That was just in Bible days. And you are incorrect. There's apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, bishops, deacons, and elders right now. Okay? So you don't want God to divide your kingdom and bring you down to the animal level. That's going to be embarrassing. And you do understand that some things you can't come back from. You may never see the glory that you had in your glory days if you're not giving glory to the Lord of heaven and earth. And God going to lift up somebody that does fear him and he's going to put the gold chain around their neck and he's going to put the purple robe on their neck, even though we may not even want it because we don't do what we do for money. We don't do what we do for self-glory. We do what we do to be vessels of the creator to be used by him for his spirit to breathe through us because to prophesy means to speak by divinely inspired utterance. Not about us, it's about him and what he's saying. Okay? So this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. And last thing, that very that very night, verse 30, Daniel 5.30, Belshazzar got killed. The Bible didn't say that he died, meaning he didn't die in his seat. The Bible said he was slain. They killed him. That's the same day he had the party, he died that night. And Darius the Mede, at the age of 62, took over Belshazzar, Belshazzar's kingdom, just like Daniel interpreted prophetically God said it was going to happen. Don't let that happen to you. Do you understand? Do you understand? Do you understand? All right. Uh, now, if you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. I'm going to take this prayer request. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you in the name of Carlton, Margot's youngest son. And we ask you, oh God, to reveal yourself to him in an unmistakable way, oh God, because the way you show us that you real is you give us unmistakable experiences, oh God, where we have experiences where ain't no answer but God, ain't nobody but you, ain't no way except by your hand and by your grace. So I ask you to open Carlton's eyes, oh God, and let him catch a vision of you. Let him see a vision of Christ, because once we see you, oh God, everything else fades to black. Once we see you, all the rest of the stuff doesn't matter. Let him see you for himself, because we can't get in on our parents' faith. You don't have any grandchildren. You have children, oh God. So let Carlton see you for himself to the saving of his soul, and that his parents may rejoice to see their child walk in truth. I release it right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke the spirit of unbelief off of Carlton. Uh, 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 the devil trying to get through his ear through philosophy and through academic things and through things that are are saying that that God is just one option among many, that Christianity is just one religion among many. It's just some type of philosophy. Uh, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that lying spirit. I rebuke that spirit that says that Jesus is just one option among many because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. Lord, you are a person, not a set of rules. So I ask you to show yourself strong because of Margot's faithfulness, because of the faithfulness, oh God, of the parents and of the prayers, oh God, that you would have mercy on Carlton and open up his eyes and ears and let him see you in an unmistakable way. And not only because we declare and decree that the devil cannot have Carlton because he's the child of a believer. So Satan, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke you. You have no authority over Carlton's life. You have no right to that son. And not only is God going to turn that situation around and fill that young man with the Holy Ghost and make the prophetic word of God come out of his mouth, but Carlton is going to become a light to all those around him to testify of a surety that Jesus is real. I release it, declare it, decree it right now. And it is so in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, amen and amen. Uh, let me check and see if I have any other prayer requests. Okay, do I have any prayer? Okay, another prayer request. So. Amen. And God bless. Thanks uh, to those of you that watch me live. Thanks to those of you that are watching on the replay. Uh, uh, now I ask you, amen, it is so. Now, remember I told you my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. 
And the reason I want to increase my reach is because when the Lord is sending prophetic words, we want as many people as possible to see them. So in every video that I do, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, okay? And so the one thing I'm going to ask you to do in this video is I want to point you again to my daily prophetic devotional. And I'm going to put this in the chat on my Facebook so anybody watching me on Instagram Live, uh, actually, I'll put the link on my Insta when I get through this broadcast. But you can also check me out on Facebook Live. The link will be there, too. I want you to take a look at my Daily Prophetic Devotional. We are in uh, quarter three. And um, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, we're in quarter three. And in my Daily Prophetic Devotional, uh, what I have done is, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, I have a prophetic scripture for every day. So you go before the Lord, you meditate on that scripture, and then you ask the Lord to give you revelation on that scripture. And that's how you begin to develop your own prophetic. But it's also a journal. So you write down the date. And then when that prophetic word comes to pass, you can write down when it came to pass when God told you. That's my daily prophetic devotional. So the one thing I'm going to ask you to do is take a look at that. So I'll put that link on Insta when I get through broadcasting for those of you watching me on Insta. And I put it in the chat on my Facebook Live. All right. So, amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you so much. And God bless all of you that watch me live and are watching the replay. I will be here uh, next Sunday. Now, those of you that were uh, had a chance to check Thursday, last Thursday was the No More Genies broadcast. And it was judgment. Ooh, Lord, have mercy. Last Thursday was judgment. We talked about romantic love. We talked about sex. We talked about marriage. We talked about what the Bible had to say. We talked about why marriages break down. We talked about our int intimacy with God breaking down. And also uh, some of the, mis the mistakes we make with our spouses and how we got to somewhere. And it was judgment. So go check out. That was No More Genies number 37. For those of you that don't know what No More, no More Genies stands for, it's uh, my ministry about getting us away from the genie concept of God and, and bringing us back to what the word actually says, because God is not a genie and faith is not magic. So we have to see what the scripture actually says. So go check that out. That's on my Facebook page and it's on my YouTube channel. No more genies. Thirty seven. Uh, the title of it is we don't have sex. No time. <laughs> yeah, it was Thursday. It was judgment. I'm telling you. So check out my prophetic devotional. Definitely check out No More Genius. I will be here next Sunday, uh, July 18th at my regular time, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. Amen. God bless. And remember, it's time for us to make sure we are giving God glory, the glory that's due him for all that he's done for us, to make sure that our hearts are not lifted up, but that we are humble before our maker to give him the glory that's due his name. Because just because he's invisible doesn't mean he's not around. Amen. God bless. And I will see you next week.